Why don't we be upstanding to welcome Josh Wood? Wow. Man, what a full morning. I feel like I could just go home full already. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> well, thanks so much for having me here. Um, it was kind of late notice. I know Daniel had asked me last night at dinner. He said, hey, would you be available to preach somewhere tomorrow morning? He didn't give me any details or anything. And I said, yeah, sure. And then next thing, Joel's texting me at like 10 o'clock last night. And here we are. But I live on the Gold Coast. And uh, it's really, it really is a blessing to be here with you. And I know that there was, um, you know, it was kind of last minute. But, you know, the, the funny thing is, is nothing's last minute for God, you know. Nothing is last minute for God. And even the, the, uh, one of the things that you said as well, Deb, see, I didn't even know about the whole conversation with this morning. But I turned to Abby and I said, it's so funny because there was something that you said which was real key to what God had put on my heart to share this morning. And uh, for, for those who, you know, you, I've been sitting in the front here for a little bit now, you've probably uh, caught a glimpse of my radical haircut. Um, I've got a few battle scars back here, so I'll just turn around. I can't really hide it, but you can check out my, my hairs. It's an interesting, it's the latest trend. You just go out, and <laughs> it's called a, the blind barber. You go to the blind barber, and they turn the, the, buzzer, the, the clippers on, and they just go to town, and you come out looking like this. No, but, but this is actually a part of my testimony. And, you know, the interesting thing for me is that I don't normally talk about it. And actually, there's something that the Lord had put on my heart to share this morning, which is something that I've never preached about before. And, uh, and, you know, normally I would go through life and I just, you know, I'm not a man with a problem. I'm a man with a savior. You know what I'm saying? I'm a man with a promise. So I, I never preach or live from whatever I'm going through. You know, I just, I get up and I preach about faith and see God do things. And people have no idea what I might be walking through at that point in time in my life. And uh, so, yeah, but actually there's something that the Lord uh, revealed to me actually when I was in San Antonio, Texas, this year, and it was, uh, and it's something that I want to share with you, if that's okay, a little bit of my journey and, and part of what this battle scar represents and, and why I'm here today. Is that all right? So, you know, my, my name's Josh Wood. I've lived on the Gold Coast my whole life. And in 2000, the start of 2009, I was brought up in a Christian home. And in the start of 2009, I had a real radical encounter with Jesus that just radically just transformed my life. Actually, God redefined for me what Christianity is. And uh, I, was, I was in a car. I was working in Brisbane at the time. I was in a car. I was driving home from work. And uh, I was stuck in peak hour traffic trying to get home to the Gold Coast. And this, I just began to just cry out to the Lord in the car as I had been for that month prior leading up to that point in time and I'm not going to go into this in, in a whole lot of detail but this prayer rose out of my heart and like I said I've been in church my whole life but I felt like there was something that I hadn't quite yet seen there was something that was I hadn't seen it didn't mean that other people didn't understand it but I hadn't seen it and I this prayer came out of my heart and I said God I'm done with religion I'm done with tradition and man's opinions and good ideas and what truth is I said I have to know what the truth is and I heard the Lord speak to me, and it was the words of Jesus from John 14, 6, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it's something that, you know, we're very familiar with, and, you know, you can go, yeah, yeah amen, praise God, Jesus is the way. But I realized that, no, no, Jesus is the way. He is the truth, and He is the life. See, if we want to know what the truth is about what the truth is, we can only find it in one place. If we want to know what the truth is, truth is an information, truth is a person, and his name is Jesus. It's in Jesus Christ. So the Lord, I, I got out in the car one person and got out of the car a different person. And I dove into the Gospels and it was as if God just cleared out the closet of my, my understanding and I, I relearned from rereading the Gospels uh, as if I'd never read them before. And whatever Jesus said, whatever Jesus did, I just took it as gospel, and I began to believe it. Whatever he said, I'm like, okay, yes, Lord, I believe it. And I began to see God break out of my life in a powerful way. I began to see miracles happen in a real profound way. And no one around me that I knew was, was seeing those things and walking that out. And so it was a real 
kind of, it was an amazing moment for me in, in my life and just what God was doing, but it was on the foundation of Jesus Christ, the truth that was revealed through Jesus Christ. And so anyway, uh, in that time in the last, what's it been, 10, almost 11 years now, um, I've seen God do way more than I ever thought I would see him do. I've seen him literally save thousands upon thousands of souls, do thousands upon thousands of miracles, signs and wonders, crazy things, some very unusual things as well. Sometimes I feel a little bit unsure about whether I should share them from the pulpit because we all, some of us have a different grit or understanding of what God does. So there's some testimonies I reserve for private. But, uh, you know, I've seen God, you know, just... Uh, just uh, open blind eyes, deaf ears, uh, just radical people, you know, like people who have been paralyzed for, you know, multiple decades, just you name it, go on and on and on, tumors disappear and, and stuff. And not one of those things has happened because of me. It's not because of something that I've done or because I have some special gift. It's all happened because of one reason, and that reason is because Jesus Christ is Lord. And he is who he says he is, and he has done what he has said he has done. And so going through that time and just seeing God do these radical things and bring me into a place of just walking in freedom from sin and freedom from myself and just experiencing the kingdom life like never before, uh, God began to connect me with people around the world like Todd and, and different ones who are also carrying the same message. And, uh, and, then, and then comes 2015. So 2015, uh, at the end of preaching, I, I start to feel a little bit funny. I sit down, and, I, and then I wake up in an ambulance, and I had a seizure. And I get rushed to hospital, and the doctors do these CT scans, and they show me these scan results, show me that there's a tumor in my head. And I'm sitting there like, no way, this is impossible. I, you know, I, I don't believe this. And through a series of events, I end up having surgery in 2015 uh, to take this tumor out of my head. And so for me, up until that point, like I said, I've been praying for, um, you know, everything that moved. I've been seeing God do wonderful things. But then there are also some things that I had prayed for, people that I had prayed for, that I didn't see breakthrough come for them. Now, I know this is that it's always God's will to heal. Amen. Jesus has already paid the price. Jesus Christ is perfect theology. If we look at Jesus, we've seen the Father. He said to Philip in John 14, because Philip, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it'll be good enough. It's sufficient for us. We'll be happy then. And he said, Philip, have I been with you for so long, and yet you don't know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father also. So how can you say, show us the Father? So what's he saying? He says, Philip, if you've seen my life, there's nothing more of the Father than is to be revealed than what has already been revealed through my life. That's what Jesus was saying. How can you say, show us the Father? There's nothing more to be revealed. So I believe that Jesus is the full manifestation and revelation of, the, of who the Father is. But you know, the cool thing is this, is that uh, Romans chapter 8 also tells us that he's the firstborn among many brethren. So you see, in the, in the understanding that Jesus is the truth, it's not just understanding that he's the truth about the Father, but Jesus Christ is also the truth about who you and I were created to be and the life that we were created to live. In fact, in 1 John chapter uh, 2, verse 6, it says, If we say that we abide in him, we ought to walk just as he walked. Sometimes people can look at that and think, well, man, my life doesn't look anything like Jesus. And we can look at it from a, a perspective of discouragement. But I want to encourage you to look at, look at it from a place of great encouragement. Because the promise of God is that we can walk just as Jesus walked. Jesus said, he who believes in me, the things that I do, the works that I do, you will do also and even greater works. And I don't think he was just talking about doing miracles. In every capacity, in every way, in everything that Jesus and who he is and what he walked in, in freedom and love and wholeness and holiness, in, in signs and wonder, wonders, in, 
in walking in authority and dominion over the demonic and over the earth, all of those things, everything we as sons and daughters of God, born in His same image, have the ability to walk in His footsteps. I'm going to have a drink because I'm a little bit thirsty. That was my preamble, by the way. I haven't started preaching yet. Now, hopefully that will that tip up here. Is this pretty... Oh, okay, there we go. I've got a little hidey hole down there. Cool. Um, so, uh, what, this is what I want to share with you today, is that in the midst of believing all of that and seeing God do all of that in and through my life, just seeing crazy stuff, actually, um, I'm up here with my mom and dad today, my, my folks. I just really want to honor them. They are amazing. I love you, mom and dad. And uh, in, in more ways than one, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them. And I was just thinking on the way up here today, just remembering a, a time that I went to Papua New Guinea, um, one of the trips I've done. I've done three to Papua New Guinea now. And I was there with my dad. My dad was there with me, and we had another few guys as well. And we went to this village. We were the first uh, white people to ever stay in this village. And, you know, many of the adults had seen white people. It was a very remote area, but a lot of the kids hadn't. And kids were seeing us and screaming and crying and running away. And, and, uh, and so anyway, so we, we rocked up the, at this village and, and all the, the, the people from the village the next morning were very curious to know who are these white pellas, as they call us, and, uh, and what are they doing in this village? And so the chief of the village, he had come, so the chief of the tribe from, from another village across some hills, and he was there. And we were talking and there's a big crowd gathered. And there was this little boy whose name was John. John was eight years old at this time. This was maybe 2010 or something like that. And, and anyway, and I saw John in the background as I'm talking to the tribal chief. And he's standing there with these makeshift crutches. And I could see his leg was all like totally twisted and, and, and it wasn't looking too good at all. And I asked the chief, I said, you know, who is this boy and what, what's his story? What happened to his leg? And he told me that this boy was climbing the mountain, one of the mountains there with some other kids. And he slipped and there was a landslide and these rocks came and crushed his leg. And they're so far from medical help. And, you know, his family is so poor anyway that even if they could get him attention, there's nothing they could do. So they literally just s s twisted his leg and put it back the best they could and wrapped it up. And, and that was it. So now his leg was, I guess, like maybe that much shorter than the other. What's that? A good couple of inches shorter than the other. And it was all twisted. So they weren't even. It was like twisted out to the side like this and a lot shorter. So when he walked, it was like really bad. And anyway, I said to the chief, I said, could I pray, could I pray for this boy? And so this boy came over and I got him to sit down on this little wooden bench. And yeah, he didn't have shoes on. And so I got him to put his feet up and I began to pray for his, his legs and a crowd, this big crowd gathered, and we were like pressed, weren't we? There were people everywhere. And so I just commanded his leg to come out in the name of Jesus. And his leg starts shaking like this. And he's saying in his language, I found out later, it's shaking, it's shaking, it's moving, it's moving. And then his leg twists like this and grows out in front of everyone. And they're just like, what the heck? People are just going crazy. And the chief's like, go and tell everyone, God is here. God is moving. Go and bring everyone. So, so that pre preceded about three or four days of radical revival and outpouring in this remote area. And we literally had hundreds and hundreds of people come from all surrounding areas, sleeping in, on outside and just repenting and worshiping. And we had like the hardest men in the village who would beat their wives and children come to the altar and just get radically saved. And we it just, I could go on and on. Actually, you guys would know um, Pastor Aaron Damianopoulos. So Aaron and I have been friends since we were 14. So Aaron was on that trip too. So you can ask him about this as well. Um, but we just had this radical time. And so, uh, so yes, yeah, so for me, like seeing that and walking that out has, has been a normal part of my life now for the last 10 years. So then here I am, fast forward. I'm just trying to set a little bit of the picture. This is the, the background. This is the backstory to help you kind of understand my process here. So fast forward to 2015, I'm laying on a hospital bed. I just had a seizure. They're showing me these scans of this thing in my head saying, there's this thing in your head. We don't know what it is, but it's caused this seizure. Now I'm sitting there thinking, man, this is impossible. Um, I'm the kind of guy that, you know, when I go to these places, you know, whether it's 
uh, you know, the jungle, whether it's Papua New Guinea, wherever, I don't have malaria tablets, I don't get injections. If you do that, I'm not against that. You know, I, I've had times and in, in times even now where I've taken medication, but that's been where I'm at because I want to grow to the place where Jesus is all that I need. Okay, so all of that bringing, coming to this point where I'm sitting there and they're telling me you got this thing in your head and I'm like, no way, I'm good, God's going to heal me, I don't need an operation and they want to operate and I, I got them to delay it for two weeks. So, okay, you know, well, look, we'll give you two weeks. You can go and pray, do your thing and come back and, and we'll see. So I went away. Is it okay if I just be real, real and vulnerable with you guys and just share my journey because I feel like it's re it might really help some people today. And so... So I go away and I'm praying and every time I'm praying, I'm like, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do about this thing that they tell me is in my head? And I, I, one of two things that I would see the Lord do, I, I would pray and then I would see the Lord just looking at me and smiling and not saying anything. Then the other thing that would happen would be in those two weeks when I would pray, go, Lord, what do you want me to do? And one day he caught me out of the blue and he said, I want you to go to Okinawa and strengthen my bride there. And I'm like, hang on a second, Jesus. Look, I'm talking to you about this thing. They tell me there's this lump in my head. What do you want me to do? I want you to go to Okinawa and strengthen my, my bride there. And I've been going to Japan now for uh, maybe about six years and ministering there and seeing God do some wonderful things. And I didn't know what Okinawa was. I'm like, okay, what? I've, I know the name of this place. Where is it? Turns out it's an island of Japan. Actually, one of the southernmost groups of islands in Japan. Long story short, I'm asking Jesus a certain question, and I feel like he's giving me a different answer. Has anyone, can anyone relate to that? Actually, sometimes we read the Gospels, it amazes me, because people would ask Jesus a question, and it was like he was answering a different question. Has anyone noticed that? So, so I'm like, okay, God, what are you trying to say to me through this? And I remember there's times, you know, my oldest boy, Harry, he's, he's 12, and there's, there's times when he gets a little bit nervous, a bit anxious about things. And in that time in life, when he would get anxious, um, I would say, Harry, look at me. And I would look at him and I would smile and I would say, Harry, do I, does daddy look worried? No, then you don't need to be worried either. Then the Lord showed me that's what I'm, he was trying to say to me. I'm like, God, what about this? And he's like, look at my face. Do I look worried? No then you don't need to be worried either. So long story short, I'm, I'm praying, I'm seeking God. This is what my process with God. And then it comes to having my, on a Sunday afternoon, I go in to have this MRI and I have this, uh, the MRI and I come out and I'm asking the, uh, I forget what they call, like the radiologist, whoever it is, who does the MRI. I'm like, so did you see the scan? Because I'm fully expecting that they're going to be like, oh my gosh, this thing's gone, we don't understand it. And, and she's like, what do you mean? I said, well, did you, did you get to see the scan? You know, can, can, you, can I talk, can I ask you a question about it? And she's like, what do you want to know? I said, well, did you see that the, the tumor's gone? Did you see that this mass is gone? And she, she laughed at me. She said, what? I said, well, I, you know, I believe that God's healed me. And she laughed at me and she said, do you honestly believe that this thing is just going to disappear just like that. And I said, yes, I do. She said, well, I'm sorry to tell you that it's still there. So I'm laying on this hospital bed that night. Uh, one of the surgeons comes in with, with the printout of these scans. And she shows me, uh, she shows me the scans. My mom's going to cry now because this is, this, is this is my journey. This is my testimony. So I'm sitting there on my bed with, with, with my Bible on my lap. And, uh, and then she comes in and shows me these scans and they say, we want to do this operation. My family, they love me. They want me to have the operation. It's just like, it's just there. Let, let them just cut your head open, take this thing out. But again, my, and, and it hasn't changed. I want to walk in a place where Jesus is all that I need. Okay. So I'm sitting there on the bed and she comes in, shows me these scans and she's saying, look, you know, it's still there. You know, we've scheduled you in. We want to schedule you in for 6 o'clock tomorrow morning, have the surgery. And I said to her, I said, look, I said, I, I honor you. Thank you for your advice. I, I understand what you're telling me. I said, but, I, but because I believe what this book says, I just can't believe what these scans are telling me. I understand that this is your evidence, but I believe what Jesus says. 
So for a lot of us, we get to places in our, and times in our life where we have this kind of attention. And this is like life or death, real, you know what I mean? This isn't just like, you know, hey, you know, I, I, I can't get a car parked today. God, I thought you loved me. How come I, you didn't give me, you know, I'm talking like this is real life, okay? So, so I'm sitting there in the bed and she literally throws the scans, the doctor throws the scans at me and walks out of the room in half. So, so this is a part of my testimony. And, and I, I felt like I'd, I'd spoke to a few different people who speak into my life and, and I felt like the most important thing at that point in time is that my wife and I found a place of agreement. And the place of agreement that we found was is that, that we would agree together that they would do the surgery and that this thing would never come back. And so we were like, okay, you know what, this is not what I want to do, this is not what I expected, but... I can agree with my wife from that place. So we, we prayed, we agreed, they did the surgery. They said, look, we took this whole thing out. I had recovery, uh, you know, from that time. Uh, and, but if I can be really honest with you, I, in, in, in a way, I hadn't changed my mind about God, but I felt like I had dropped the ball. I'm like, God, what am I missing? You know, how did this happen? You know, why didn't I see the breakthrough the way that I want to see it? And some of us can relate to that, you know what I'm saying? And sometimes we can, and that's, that's why I want to share you some testimonies beforehand about some of the amazing things I saw God do, because sometimes we can watch Todd White or whoever it is on YouTube and see all the highlight reel of like all these amazing things. And, but the reality is, is even guys like that, I, I, Todd's a good friend of mine, we were with him and his family this year, we don't always see everything turn out the way that we expect it to or the way that we believe it to. So what do we do when that happens? This is what I'm preaching about today. What do we do? What does that mean? Why? You know, sometimes we're in that situation like, why is this happening? So fast forward to last year, and, uh, and for years I'd have scans and everything. They said, hey, look, you know, you all look good. See you again in 12 months' time. Fast forward to, to the first part of last year, and, and they told me, look, by the way, there's, you know, we've been monitoring this thing in there and 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 uh and we'd like to do a biopsy yada 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 and so that was a real shock because up until then they said hey you're all good see you in another 12 months for another scan now all of a sudden they're telling me that there's something in there and they want to investigate and see what it is and and I, i'm thinking firstly i'm coming out of there and i'm thinking well you know, hang on a minute, my wife and I, we pray, we agreed, boom, this is it, it's done, they did the surgery, and now they're telling me that it's back again. And so it's in that place where faith is tested. Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, and a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then the Bible says that the Holy Spirit led him out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And the devil said, if you are the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. See, the temptation wasn't about his, the food. It had nothing to do with turning a stone into bread. The devil was saying, if you are the Son of God, where the Father had just said, you are my Son, this is my beloved Son. So leading up to that time in 2015 when that happened, um, you know, I remember waking up one night before that had even happened, like a couple months before, and I woke up and I, I was like shouting out as I woke up. And this is the words that came out of my mouth. I woke up saying, I will not change my mind about you. And it shocked me. I'm like, whoa, where did that come from? You see, because the enemy wants to change your mind about Jesus. He wants you to change your mind. See, Nebuchadnezzar, when he set up that golden statue, that golden image of himself and told everyone to bow down to him, then he threatened Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and said, if you will not bow down, I will kill you. Will you change your mind? 
they wouldn't change their mind. All right, well, I'm going to turn it up seven times hotter. Will you change your mind? We will not change our mind. They threw them into the fire, but the fire couldn't put out the fire that was on the inside of them. And uh, I'm convinced that, that, the, that what the enemy wants to do is he wants to come and he wants to test what God has put on the inside of you. And he wants to see, will you change your mind? Will you change your mind? And so fast forward again to 2018 last year, going through this process. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to walk by faith, trust in the Lord. And, uh, and I'm just going to try and be a good steward of my body. Um, this year we were in the United States. We we're in Texas. We we're over there with my wife and my two sons for two months of ministry traveling through the U.S., and we're in Texas in a, in a city there called San Marcos. And I'm preaching. And I'm feeling really weird before the message. I'm feeling really weird during the message. I'm like, okay, you know, something's going on here. Um, and at the start of the message, I had this word of knowledge. And then I give this word of knowledge. Uh, and it was the name Anderson. And it was... Um, I forget there was another part of it. I think it maybe something to do with the ankle or something like that. Anyway, I give this word of knowledge. This person stands up in response to the word of knowledge and they get healed and then I fall down and have a seizure at the same time. So I wake up once again. I'm in hospital and the doctors tell me I had a seizure. And long story short, here I am again. So it's in those times where we can be like, God, why is this happening? What is going on? And, you know, you shared, Deb, just before, you know, when people, uh, I think it was, you said people came to Izzy or something and they were saying, you know, why is all this stuff happening in my family? And she said, because you live in this world. You know, Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but take courage because I have overcome the world. You know, Jesus says in uh, in in a couple of different places here, I, I've, I've got some, some scripture. Don't worry, I'm going to quote some scripture in a minute. Um, it, yeah, he says in, uh, in, in Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter uh, 14, uh, if you want to turn there with me right now real quick. Luke chapter 14, actually we'll hold your finger on that spot, we'll flip back actually to Luke uh, chapter 6 first. Luke chapter 6, verse uh, 46. He says this in, in Luke 6, verse 46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my saying, sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and it could not shake it for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the, uh, the stream beat ve vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of the house was great. You know, what's interesting is, is that the same storm came against both houses. Whether the house was built on the rock or built on the sand, built on the earth, the same storm came against both of those houses. And sometimes when we're in the storm, we're thinking, Jesus, where are you? What, what are you doing? Don't you care that we're perishing? If you remember the account of Jesus in the boat with his disciples in the storm, Jesus is fast asleep. And, and the Bible says that the wind and the waves were, were actually coming against the boat to the point that water was coming into the boat and Jesus is laying there asleep. And the disciples were in the same boat, in the same storm. Jesus was sound asleep and they were freaking out like thinking, Jesus, don't you care about us? I thought you loved me, Lord, and here we are about to die. But faith looks like Jesus sleeping in the boat in the midst of the storm. You know, Jesus got up and he calmed the wind and the waves. They were amazed and said, wow, man, who is this guy who has power even over the wind and the waves? 
But you know, the, the reality is, is that the greatest miracle actually wasn't Jesus calming the storm. Do you realize that? The greatest miracle was Jesus being able to sleep through the midst of the storm. So for me in this situation, I, I'm waking up, I'm in hospital, here I am again. You know, what, what's going on? And uh, in praise God, uh, I was in the most, uh, I was transferred to Austin, which I'm told is the most liberal city in Texas. And it just so happens that the this, this surgeon, the brain surgeon who walked in that day was a spirit-filled man of God. And he came in and uh, Dr. Kim, and Dr. Kim had, uh, when I found out that he was a believer, I was pretty blown away. And he prayed with us every day. And even though I didn't understand what was going on, I had peace in my heart. And this is something that we all have to walk out. I had peace in my heart. You know what? I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand why this is happening. But I know that God is with me. I know that Jesus is with me. And actually, I know that Jesus is in this man. So I'm actually going to trust Jesus in this man that he can do what he's telling me he can do. He can help me. So he expected there would be about a four-hour surgery and four to five hours. And when you, go, when you have brain surgery, this isn't just like operating on your pinky. This is operating on your brain. So you have to sign all sorts of disclaimers. You can have a stroke. You can die. You can come out paralyzed, quadruple, well, everything. So they have to disclose all that stuff. You have to agree to that, sign a waiver. Okay, here we go. And so anyway, so here I am in the boat in the midst of the storm. And I go into the surgery, and what was meant to be a four-hour surgery was a 12-hour surgery. 12 hours they had my head open, operating on my brain. And the longer that you're, you're, that's happening, the more possible complications. And I come out of that place and, uh, and praise God what he did in my body, and the recovery was phenomenal. Like w within, like, you know, you come out and they've got, all sorts of drips in you and they're pumping whatever morphine or whatever into, into you. The moment that was all out, I wanted that out as soon as possible. Um, within 48 hours, I wasn't even taking a Panadol. You know what I'm saying? And I had doctors coming in, look at my chart, you know, at like day five saying, you know, okay, so what are you taking for pain? Because like, I don't see anything on here. Oh, I, I'm not taking anything. And they look at me like, what? What do you mean you're not taking anything? Like, you know, you don't have to just be tough, like, you know, take something. And I'm like, I don't have any pain. I haven't had anything, any pain for like within 24 hours after the surgery. You know, like uh, there was so many uh, amazing miracles along the way. I could just recount, you know, miracles after miracles and nurses and doctors who have been in that, that department for years saying, we've never had a patient do what you're doing. Within a couple of days, like I'm down walking around, you know, taking myself down to the cafeteria. I'm still in ICU, and they have to do me up in a little doggy bag, a little to-go box with my pills, saying, we've never done this for a patient before. Here's your little to-go bag for your pills. And I would go down to the cafeteria and have my lunch or whatever and come back. And, and uh, you know, when I left, when, I, when they finally let me go, because I really wanted to get going before that, um, I walked out of the hospital, carried my own bags, and, you know, the nurse there was just blown away saying, I've, I've, I've worked in this ward for four years and I've never seen anyone, li like, leave like this. You know what I mean? Like, people who have gone through what you've gone through to within a few days, literally carrying their own bags, walking out of the hospital. Crazy. You know, and but we were just contending, like, okay, you know, they did the surgery, but they said that there was still a little bit remaining. And when you're going through... The fire, you have every opportunity to change your mind. And you, you're sitting there and you're having these conversations with doctors. You know, I sat down with, with one of the best, if not the best, neurosurgeons in the United States in another hospital. And he's telling me after a month later, saying, you know, they, they checked the tumor, they did the grading. You know, by now... Everything that I know is world class. So he didn't say that, but everything we know about this tumor, everything that I know as a neurosurgeon, by now this tumor is going to be back to the same size as it was a month ago when they took it out. So you can't leave Texas, you can't leave the United States, we need to do another surgery. And I said, Look, just let me have one more scan. You know how many one more scans I've had? Just let me have one more scan because I know, 
I know that I know that I know that at some point in time, I'm going to have the scan and the scan's going to show them what I already know. You know, I love the example of Abraham because God came to Abraham, they say, when he was about maybe 75 years old and said that you're going to be the father, not just the one child, but you're going to be the father of the multitude. And the Bible says that he believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. The Bible teaches us that he did not consider his own body, the weakness of his own flesh, but he believed God. They say that about 25 years went by before he had Isaac. 25 years. So it's not just like God said, guess what, buddy, you're going to have a baby and it's going to be wonderful. And then within nine to ten months time, Sarah has a baby. 25 years passed by and Abraham did not change his mind. You can imagine his friends. Well, hey, Abraham, Abe, Abe, baby. You're not getting any younger. Every year that goes past, it's just going to get harder. Sarah laughed. It seemed like a bit of a joke. But Abraham knew that he who promised is faithful. And regardless of what he experienced, regardless of natural knowledge, regardless of what people had told him, look, I don't want to be crude, but I don't think they waited 25 years to try. Okay. <laughs> If God said you're going to be a father, I'm sure they tried for 25 years to have a baby. Okay, so it wasn't as if they weren't trying. But yet it didn't happen. And day after day, year after year, Abraham accounted him who promised as faithful. So day after day, month after month, year after year, I've sat through doctor's appointments and had doctors say all sorts of terrible things and I've walked out of that office with just as much joy and just as much peace as when I walked in because I count him who promises faithful. And even though I haven't had the evidence to say, look, I told you so, even though I haven't, there's been so many times where I haven't had the evidence, it hasn't changed my mind. You know what? Because I discovered something. That if man can convince you of something, then man can convince you out of it. But when God convinces you of something, no man can convince you out of it. If God convinces you of the truth, if God reveals the truth to your heart, it doesn't matter what you face. It doesn't matter what you go through. It doesn't matter what the doctor tells you, that it can't change what you believe because you didn't make your mind up. He made your mind up for you. So this doctor saying, by now, the thing would have grown to the same size. We need to do surgery. And I'm saying, look, just give me one more MRI. Just one more. So I have this MRI. And I'm praying beforehand. I'm talking to Jesus. And I go in. I have this thing. I've had countless MRIs now. I don't even know how many. I fall asleep in them now. Just put, go in. They put the thing on my head and put me in the tube. And I just fall asleep. Um, and so anyway, I had this MRI and I, we go back the next day to see the medical oncologist. So that was the neurosurgeon, top neurosurgeon who said that we have an appointment next morning to see the new, uh, the medical oncologist. And he shows us the scan and he says, well, I don't know what to say about this, but it's still there, but it's actually probably about the same size as it was when you, a month ago, we were expecting it to be, had grown to the same size again. But it's actually, if it's grown, it's maybe like a tiny little bit, like a couple of millimeters, it's probably about the same size. So according to like world-class neurosurgeon who said it should have been this size, it wasn't that, but yet it wasn't the full manifestation of the miracle. But I'm like, I knew it. You know what it was for me? It was, it was the cloud the size of a man's fist, a man's hand. I'm like, you know what, it might not be the full thing right now, it might not be the, the rainstorm that I'm expecting, but I see something. God is doing something, there is a cloud the size of a man's hand. And so it was because of that MRI that not only did they not have to do another emergency surgery, but they, the doctor had to fill out like a 30 page report for the airline to let me fly, but they released me to come back to Australia. I came back to Australia, 
um, and I un underwent uh, radiation and chemo at a hospital in Brisbane. That's why I've got this radical haircut. The radiation beam just zzz, zaps out all your hair. Um, I don't really care. I, 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 I would wear a hat for a little while because it looks pretty scary, particularly for kids. But I'm kind of like, people are like, why don't you wear a hat? And I'm like, you know what? I don't really care. It's like, <laughs> once upon a time, I used to be worried when I was a young man. I don't want to go bald when I get older. Now I'm like, take a look at this. It can't get any worse than this right here. You know what? But it's a battle scar. That's right. Because my life is a walking testimony of the power of Jesus Christ. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And this is my testimony. So anyway, uh, I underwent that treatment. And, and they said to me, when I finished that six-week treatment, the doctor said, now look, you need to know, you're going to do the six-week treatment when I come back to Australia. You're going to have a about a month off, and then we're going to do another scan. But you need to know, you need to be prepared that it's actually probably going to look worse. Best case scenario, to look the same. But don't expect you're going to see any change, because we never do. And so I've had that conversation more times than I care to count. And they knew right from the get-go. Every, every time I meet a doctor, I'm like, you need to know something that I believe that Jesus has healed me. Not that he's going to heal me. He's already healed me. I know I don't have the evidence, and I know you probably all think I'm crazy because I've had this conversation with countless doctors, medical experts, but I'm telling you I'm healed. And you're going to see that I'm healed. And they look at you like you're crazy, as they do. They throw, they throw MRI scans at you and storm out of the room and all the rest of it. So in the natural, I have no reason to believe. In the natural, I have no reason to have joy. According to every report of man, I have no reason to, to walk in faith. But whose report do I believe? I, I believe the report of the Lord. I don't care what the wind and the waves tell me. I don't care what the doctors tell me. I care and I believe what the Lord tells me. I honor them. I respect them. I listen to what they say, but if it's contrary to what God has said to me, then I've got a decision to make. Whose report am I going to believe? So anyway, fast forward to that, uh, that month later, that scan. And, uh, and we, uh, that was maybe about three weeks ago now. And so I, we go, my wife and I, every day, my wife had to drive me up because after having brain surgery, you're not allowed to drive for six months. So I'm still, I'm still a couple months out from, from driving yet. Dang it. But uh, so my wife and I were walking into the, the, the doctor's office. And again, just same Jesus. The gospel doesn't change. Jesus is still on the throne. I'm not having a How can I have a bad day when he's Lord? Seriously. So anyway, we go into this appointment and we sit down with the doctor. And, you know, normally... Uh, you know, I love doctors. Normally, because of duty of care and all the rest of it, they like to tell you worst case scenario and they play things down and they're not very overly excitable. Has anyone noticed that with doctors generally, okay? I'm just being honest, all right? So if you're a doctor, I don't mean to offend you, but that's just how it is and I understand. Um, and a lot of the times in these situations, they're used to giving bad reports and they don't want to get people's hopes up and all that kind of thing. So anyway, we're sitting down and he said, look, I need to talk to you about this scan. I want to show you something. And he brought up on the screen the previous scan that I had and the latest scan. And he, he showed us uh, the remains of this tumor. He said, see this spot here? This is the part that I was the most concerned about. And he said, and look at your scan that you had today or yesterday, whatever it was. He said, it's not even detectable anymore. He said, this one last part over here Look at the size of it here, and on the latest scan, it's shrunk down by at least 50%. And he said to me, he said, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And I said, praying. And he laughed. He started laughing. He said, well, keep praying. Keep doing it. And so we've since been told again, after that, all the doctors have said, like, that is... Like that is very, you know, I mean, that doesn't happen. Don't expect that that kind of result that soon would ever even take place like that. So that, that was the last report. But the funny thing is, is that a couple of days later, I said to, said to my wife, Elise, you know, I was kind of just processing life and things. And I said, you know, honey, isn't it so funny that we actually didn't have a, an emotional reaction to that? 
I'm not sitting in the doctor's office waiting for the doctor to tell me that and then I'm going to, and I don't mean to be crude, but I'm not going to burst into tears and, and sigh a sigh of relief. Because, see, he's already telling me what I already knew. And, and all that he's telling me is what I already knew and the scans are just showing what I already knew is true. And we walked into that appointment with just as much joy, just as much peace and, peace and faith as we walked out of it. Because, see, our faith isn't determined or shouldn't be determined by our circumstance. Our faith is determined by the faithful one. See, we can have faith because he is faithful. How am I going for time? Oh, wow. It's probably finished time. Is it finished time? No? I'm just kind of getting started, actually. <clears throat> Oh, wow. So much fun following Jesus. So, so I just really, you know, there's a couple of things that I want to share and I'll just weigh that up in a minute if I want to do this. But I, I want to encourage you. Jesus is who he said he is. And he has done what he has said he would do. He hung on the cross and he didn't say, oh, it's almost finished. He said, it is finished. It is finished. Now we might look around our lives, we might look at ourselves, we might look at what's going on in the world and think, oh man, there's this and there's that and I'm facing this problem, that issue. But I'll tell you what, when you look at the face of Jesus, nothing else matters. When you look at the face of Jesus, people will be able to look into your face and see his face. And just before I had that report, the week before, actually, they, they did an interview with me. They'd asked me previously, they said, look, could we do an interview with you for our magazine and all our marketing material and stuff? I'm like, yeah, sure. So they called me up, and this is before I had that good report. And, uh, and I, I did this over-the-phone interview, and I said to the lady who did the interview, I said, just, just so you know, I want to give you a little heads up. Whatever question that you ask me, the answer is probably going to have something to do with Jesus. <laughs> and she's like, oh, that's okay. And so anyway, so she's asking me all this question. I just got to share my testimony. And she's like, wow, that's amazing. Praise God. Wow, that's so beautiful. Well, she wasn't saying praise God, but she was like, wow, that's so beautiful. That's amazing. And, and I just shared just exactly what I said now. But at that point, I didn't have any physical evidence to say, look, here we, here we go. And then the next week, we were in that meeting with, with the doctor and we missed the first little part of what he said, but my wife quickly got out of her mobile phone and started recording, and she managed to catch the end part of what he said, and you know about how this whole, you know, the whole part that he was most concerned about disappeared, and everything. That's on on Facebook now, and I sent that video to the lady who did the to did the interview, because I'm like, you know, what do you want to use this, you know, interview for? And she said, well, she actually said it's going to depend on, upon the result is what she said, it's going to depend on the outcome. So I sent her this video and I'm like, have a look at this, because this is the doctor of the clinic saying, keep praying. So what a testimony that is, you know? So praise God. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not a product of life. I'm a product of his life. I'm not a, a product of what I go through. I'm a product of what he went through. And it's about time as the body of Christ that we, that we dig our feet in, into the ground, that we dig our heels in the sand and we say, you know what, I believe the Lord. I believe God. And I'm, not, I'm no longer going to be tossed to and fro by life, by situations, by circumstance. Because the truth is that even as sons and daughters of God, sometimes we're so dictated by life and by problems and by circumstance that we can be just as affected by them as people who don't even know the Lord. But I want to tell you there's a better way. There is a better way. And that's the way of faith. That's the way of following Jesus. Because after coming out of that operation this year and having an operation, I, um, 
I was in, in a church. I actually went back to the same church where I had the seizure. And I was praying. Um, and I'm just like, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I, I saw Jesus in the boat. And he was just laying down sleeping in the middle of the storm. And then in the spirit, I saw myself or I interacted with that vision. I just laid down on the boat next to Jesus and closed my eyes. <laughs> Even though the boat was getting tossed around, I'm like, I'm doing what he's going to do, what he's doing. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. I only want to do what I see Jesus doing. Because when I do what he does, I align myself with him. I align myself with heaven and I will see the same fruit that he saw. Has this helped anyone today at all? Yeah? A bit of a different kind of a message for me, but I just really wanted to just share some of my journey and I hope that it encourages you to know him, to seek him, to seek his face to allow him to breathe upon you. See, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He wants to make our flesh look like the word. I'm just going to finish on this one point and then, you know, I just want to invite those who want to come forward for prayer, for healing, whatever it might be. I want to pray for you. I want to bless you. And uh, I want to finish on this point and let this be an encouragement to all of us. And, and this is actually really to quote uh, John G. Lake, if anyone knows who John G. Lake is. He said, in, in the same way that Christ was able to say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. God's heart and his will and his desire and his plan for Christianity is that as a Christian, we would be able to say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Christ. That's true Christianity. That's God's heart and desire for every single one of us. And it's his invitation. It's his invitation. Will you encounter storms? Yes, you will. But just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to King Nebuchadnezzar, what is your fire to us? What is your fire to us? Turn it up seven times. Turn it up 700 times. I don't care. What is your fire to us? And look at what great testimony God did in and through their life and their faith. Imagine what he can do through our lives when we keep our eyes on him. It's good. Jesus is Lord. Well, let's just... Let's just have a time now maybe of worship. And if you want prayer for anything, please come on down the front. I'd love to pray for you. And uh, I uh, normally I'd really go after, you know, words of knowledge and, 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 and things like that. But I just really want to share my heart with you today. I just really felt to do that. I did feel, though, that there, there's someone here who has a problem with their shoulder. I think maybe it might be your right shoulder. Um, I want to pray for you. Um, also, I don't know if there's a, a Jessica here, if there's a Jessica at all. Um, I heard that name before when I was praying as well, but I'd love to. It's your shoulder. Do you have pain right now, buddy? No? No? Okay, what's your name? Stefan? Is that right? Let's just re reach out our hands to Stefan right now. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, right now that your kingdom has come. Your kingdom has come. So, Lord, we release the power of your kingdom upon this shoulder right now. Shoulder, we command you, be restored, be made whole and be made new right now. And we thank you, Lord God, that no pain returns and full mobility comes back right now. In the name of Jesus. Now, can I ask you a question? Was there anything you couldn't do or anything if you moved it that it would hurt? Like, can you test it out right now? Or How's that feeling? Does it feel different? Yeah? Good? Come on. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Does anyone here have a problem with one of their feet? 
your foot. Yeah? Okay, does anyone have pain in their foot like right now? Pain in their foot right now? You do? Oh, look at you. Come on in. Let's pray. So if that's you, if you have, if anyone else has a shoulder problem or problem with your foot or any other problem, but specifically those, come on up at the front right now and I'm going to pray for you. And, and I know the ministry team would love to pray for you too. I don't want to keep you too long today, but I, I know that, um, yeah, I just, I don't want to keep you too long. So I'm just going to close in prayer. And, and again, if you want prayer ministry, just come on forward. So Father, we just thank you. We thank you that we can have faith because you are faithful. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the way, you are the truth and you are the life. And we honour you this morning, King Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for what you've done in our lives. We thank you for what you're doing and we thank you for what you're about to do. Thank you, Father. Lord, I pray that, Lord, the words that, uh, that you shared through me today, Lord, I pray that the testimony that I shared, Lord God, would just uh, would bring forth fruit in the lives of everyone who heard it today, Father. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for your example. Thank you for your example, Lord, of what faith looks like, that faith looks like trust so Lord I pray that you would help us all to grow in a deeper place of trust through intimacy with you so that Lord even as we sail through life if we encounter storms and wind and waves Lord that we are so grounded and founded in the truth that we have the ability Lord to lay down and to sleep and live and live in and from a place of rest, even in the midst of trials and tribulations. And we thank you, Jesus, that you didn't send the storm. You don't send sickness, Lord. It's not your will. So, Father, we pray even now, Lord, uh, I declare that as we pray and as we release the power of your kingdom, that sickness and pain and disease will flee in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Wow, there's a lot of people up the front. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. So, so if you have a problem with your foot right now, could you just put your hand up high? I could ask you to hop on one leg, but that would just be mean to do that. Put your hand up high. Okay, so there's a number of people with, with um, feet issues. So if you have a symptom in your foot right now, keep your hand up. Okay, so there's a number of people. So just keep your head up right now. So let's just, as the body of Christ, let's just stretch out our hands towards them right now, okay? So Jesus said, speak to the mountain and command it to be moved. So right now we speak to you feet in the name of Jesus Christ. We command you be healed right now. We release the power of the kingdom of God and we command healing take place right now. All pain leave in Jesus' name. Touch your Lord right now. Thank you, Jesus. 100%. 50%. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you for 100% right now. So just touch out your feet right now. Thank you, Father, Lord. Your word says that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. You are the author and the perfecter of our faith. So right now, we thank you for the work that you've done in this foot and in, in the others, Lord, and we declare 100%, 100%. Jesus took every stripe, so every pain, every symptom leave right now in the name of Jesus. Touch the Lord right now. to what it was. I couldn't even put pressure on it before, before yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, 
it's up to you. But if you want to, why don't you just walk with me and just give thanks to the Lord right now. So if you need healing in this line, just receive it, okay? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So just give me a wave if you've experienced healing already in the lineup this morning. Who else has experienced healing or some kind of change going on? Who else? Anyone else yet? So Father, we just thank you. I'm just going to come along. It will take me too long to pray in detail. But see, I don't need to know what's wrong. I just need to know what Jesus made right. Okay? So I'm just going to go along and touch you right now. And I'm just going to release the kingdom of God. I'm going to release the kingdom of heaven upon you right now. And I just declare healing on everyone I touch in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Who needs prayer right now? Father, thank you. Thank you. Be healed in Jesus' name. Receive your healing right now in the name of Jesus. Touch him right now, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed. Receive it right now. I release it right now. I release it right now in Jesus' name. Just test your body. If you can test it, if you have a symptom, be healed right now. Be restored, restored, restored. Everything the enemy has stolen from you, I'm restoring, says the Lord. The enemy has come against you and against your family, even against your finances, and the Lord is bringing restoration, restoration in Jesus' name. Restoration in the name of Jesus. Full healing right now. Be healed, be healed, be healed in Jesus' name. Receive it right now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just thank you. Touch this little fella. You're healed in Jesus' name. Jesus loves you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Right now. Right now, receive it in the name of Jesus. Let's just sing to the Lord. Let's just begin, if we can, just to praise the name of Jesus. If you need to rush off, you can do that. I'll hand over to Pastor Joel, Pastor Abby, whoever now wants to come forward and grab the mic. But if you want to stay just in this moment, and uh, if you want more prayer, you can stay up here and I'll pray for you. If you want to go sit down, you can do that. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let me just give the Lord a big hand. Lord, we thank you, Father, for what you're doing here. How many just uh, so we're impacted by that message? Yeah, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, that no, that you are able. You are able. Not only are you willing, but you are able. But we thank you, Father, that the perfect will of God is for us to live free, healed, set free in Jesus' mighty name. Why don't you just lift your hands to heaven? We just thank you, Father. Lord, we are expecting greater things in Jesus' mighty name greater things. Lord, we thank you, Father, for the miraculous to begin to invade our everyday world in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Father.